Hey guys, welcome to another video in this lecture series. Today we're going to talk about peripheral arterial disease, or PAD, and ischemic gangrene in the foot. This is one of the most commonly tested interview questions you're going to have. But before we get started, I'd like to make it clear that the content in this video is not meant to be a treatment algorithm or a treatment plan for any patient. So let's get started. The first thing you want to know are the major risk factors. So prior to past medical history, most of these patients will have diabetes, CKD, or chronic kidney disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and a history of chronic smoking. The next thing you want to understand is the systemic nature of peripheral arterial disease. So although PAD is generally considered just of the lower extremities, you have to understand that atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis of literans is really a systemic process that, ex that affects arteries throughout the vasculature. So one of the ways you want to understand this is that if you ever go through some of the vascular articles, you're going to read a lot of articles that show a correlation between an ABI that's less than 0.9 or a, a toe brachial index that's less than 0.5 and that association with MACE. MACE or M-A-C-E is a major adverse cardiovascular event such as an MI or myocardial infarction. And the reason a low TBI or an ABI in the lower extremity is associated with MACE is because, like we said, atherosclerosis is a systemic process. So the same disease process that's affecting the lower extremity can also affect your renal arteries, your carotid arteries, and also your coronary arteries. So when you think about patients with PAD in the lower extremities, you think about intermittent claudication or ischemic rest pain. So that's true for the lower extremity, but the equivalent is angina pectoris in the heart and the equivalent to the brain is a TIA or a transient ischemic attack. So when you have patients that have a history of a TIA or angina pectoris or intermittent claudication, you should understand that that's because atherosclerosis is a systemic process. And so one of the ways you can use this to your advantage on your interviews is if when they ask you as part of your case study what tests do you want to order or what do you want to know about the patient in terms of the past medical history most students will say I want to order ABI, PVRs and I want to know does this patient have a history of intermittent claudication in the lower extremity that's true, you're not wrong for saying that but if you start to think outside the box you can also ask has this patient ever had a TIA or has, does this patient complain of chest pain with exertion or angina pectoris. So those are some of the things that can really make you stand out during your interview is if you understand the systemic and global nature of this disease process. The next thing you need to understand is how does the body compensate? There are two major ways that the body compensates for chronic limb ischemia. Number one is something called collaterals. The body will form collaterals. So for example, if there's a stenosis or a plaque that's building up in one of the major arteries in the lower extremity, the body will form collaterals as a way to compensate to provide blood flow to that tissue around the area. Another term for collaterals is neovascularization or angiogenesis. So collaterals, neovascularization, and angiogenesis are interchangeable terms. Another way the body compensates is that patients that have chronic kidney disease and tissue ischemia or even chronic smokers, one of the ways the body tissues compensate is that they're so used to being in an ischemic state that they actually build a tolerance and they rely on anaerobic respiration for survival. Now let's go over some of the tests that you order to evaluate for peripheral arterial disease. The first one you're going to order is your ABI and there are several questions they're going to ask you on this topic. The first thing you need to know is a normal reference range, and that's between 0.9 and 1.3, so you must know those numbers. The second thing you need to know are what are the two major limitations to your ABI. The first one is that it does not assess for microvascular disease, and the second one is that if you have medial wall calcinosis or calcified arteries, you could get a falsely elevated ABI, such as a 1.4. So the first thing was does not assess microvascular 
and the second thing, it can be falsely elevated. And it can actually be falsely elevated in about one-third of patients because about one-third of patients that have peripheral arterial disease actually have calcified vessels because they have a history of chronic kidney disease or diabetes, were the two main causes of monkey sclerosis. But we'll get back to this later on. The other thing you should know about an ABI is how to actually interpret the results if it's low. So what they might do is give you the results of an ABI that's low, such as 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, and say, can you tell us how to actually interpret this? So they might put it up on a PowerPoint, or they might give you a handout. And when you're looking at it, you have to understand that when they take an ABI, they put blood pressure cuffs at different parts of your leg and your thigh. And what you're looking for is a drop of 20 millimeters of mercury between two adjacent blood pressure cuffs, or two adjacent readings. So if you see a 120, and then you see an 80, and that's a drop of more than 20, you're thinking that's the place where the lesion is likely occurring. So that's the first test is the ABI. The second test you need to be familiar with is a PVR, your pulse volume recording. This is a really great test because it tells you how much volume is actually going for every single pulse or every single heartbeat. And it's also good because it's not affected by calcified arteries. So whereas the ABI was affected by calcified arteries, the PVR is not. So this is really helpful. The third test you want to be familiar with are your toe systolic pressure and your TBI, or your toe brachial index. These are extremely helpful because, generally speaking, the digital arteries are not affected by medial wall calcinosis. So whereas the larger arteries, such as your tibial, peroneal, popliteal, femoral, those can be affected by medial wall calcinosis, the digital arteries usually are not. So many times, they give these exams more credence when you're evaluating a patient and trying to test a prognosis for healing. So the numbers that you need to know is a total systolic pressure less than 30 millimeters of mercury, or a TBI, a total brachial index less than 0.5, indicates very poor prognosis for tissue healing, and these patients will likely need to be revascularized. So those are the two numbers you need to know, 30 millimeters of mercury, and a TBI less than 0.5 indicate a poor prognosis. The next test is a TCPO2, or your transcutaneous pressure of oxygen. Now this, this test has its limitations, and there's three major limitations to this test. Number one is that it doesn't actually directly test how much pressure of oxygen is coming in, or the arterial pressure. It's more of a surrogate test. The second limitation is if a person has a history of an amputation, this test is not going to be as effective. The third thing you need to know is if a person has hypothermia or also has an active infection, you could actually get a falsely low result. So if you have a TCPO2 and it's within normal limits, and within normal limits is usually anything more than 40 or 50, those are usually better numbers and indicate good tissue healing if it's greater than 40. However, if you have a TCPO2 that's between 25 and 40, that doesn't necessarily mean this tissue or this foot is at risk of ischemia. It could be low because of hypothermia, previous history of amputations, or an active infection. So a high number or a number within normal limits tells you this tissue has good prognosis for healing. But a low number does not necessarily mean this person has ischemia. So oftentimes, if you speak to vascular surgeons, they really rely on the ABI, PVR, and most importantly, the toe brachial index and the toe systolic pressure when you're looking at an ischemic toe to determine if this person needs to get an angiogram. Not necessarily the TCPO2. They don't give this one too much credence. But it's still important to know for your interviews. And then finally, the gold standard is angiogram, because this one is actually invasive, and you get a good picture of the arterioles, of the arteries coming down to the lower extremity. So, they'll order these tests first, and if needed, they'll take the person into the OR and do an angiogram. A question that might come up during the interview is differentiating macular sclerosis from calciphylaxis. 
Now we alluded to macular sclerosis when we talked about the ABIs being falsely elevated. So macular sclerosis causes calcification of the tunica media of the arteries. So that's the first thing you need to know histologically. It causes calcification of the tunica media. The second thing you need to know is that in these beginning stages, it does not impede blood flow to the lower extremities. So another way to think about it is that you could have an ABI of 1.4, which is falsely elevated, but have a normal PVR, which means yes, the arteries are being calcified, but the amount of blood coming down to the lower extremity is still within normal limits. Now with advanced stages for patients that have macular sclerosis for many years, they can actually get narrowing of the lumen and that can impede blood flow to the lower extremities. Calciphylaxis is a condition that is most commonly seen in patients with end-stage renal disease and also hyperparathyroidism. It can also be seen in patients with multiple myeloma or autoimmune disorders such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. What causes this is an increase in your calcium phosphate product and so you get calcifications of the tunica intima of the small arteries, specifically in your subcutaneous fat. And the clinical manifestation is these, per these patients will get a number of ulcerations and nodules, usually ischemic ulcerations throughout the body. What you need to know about this condition is that it has a very, very low prognosis for survival. If you go through the literature, about 50% of patients with calciphylaxis will usually die within one year from the onset of the symptoms. So it has a very low prognosis. But it's not necessarily a peripheral arterial disease the way you think about atherosclerosis. You're not getting a fatty screen with a plaque buildup. What you're really getting is calcified small arteries and arterioles in your subcutaneous fat. Finally, let's do a case study. They'll show you a picture of a patient's foot. And let's just say this person has a necrotic hallux with an ulceration subfirst metatarsal head. And they tell you it's been there for months, maybe six, seven, eight months, and this person is coming in from a nursing home. First thing you want to do is get baseline x-rays. So what do you expect to see on x-ray? So let's say the person has signs of osteomyelitis in the first metatarsal head because his ulcer has been there for so long. And the second thing you see is something called mummification of tissue. And this is something you're going to see in the hallux. They'll look like small gas bubbles, but it's not a gas gangrene. It's really just mummification of tissues, and that's a sign of ischemic gangrene. So that's the first thing is your baseline x-ray. And then you decide you want to take this person in for a partial first ray in. Because the person has osteomyelitis, with a non-healing ulcer, and also a necrotic toe. So you decide, let's do a partial first ray. But before you do, there's a few things you want to get down first. The second thing is labs. So what you're really looking for is making sure there's no acute signs of infection. Most patients that have chronic limb ischemia with necrotic toes or just chronic non-healing ulcers, they won't necessarily have signs of sepsis and they won't have a leukocytosis or a left shift, which is something you see more so in an in acute infection setting. These patients usually will not have that. But you want to get the labs done, that's really important because we're going to talk about this in a moment, but if you're going to do a revascularization procedure, or if vascular does a revascularization procedure, they won't do it in the setting of an acute infection. So for the purpose of this, this person does not have an acute infection, just has chronic limb ischemia with a chronic ulceration that will not heal. When you go downstairs and do your physical exam, what are some of the main things you want to highlight during your interview? What you're looking for is non-palpable pulses, your capillary flow time or your CFT will be sluggish, maybe five, six, seven seconds. That's another sign. Also, absence of hair growth is another big sign of compromised blood flow. You might see dependent rubber, you might see blanching of the skin. All of these are signs of peripheral arterial disease. And then in your HPI, I already told you this person has this for this necrotic toe for about six, seven months with this ulcer. But let's just say this was a different patient who came in with a necrotic fifth digit and with no ulceration. The first thing you want to know is this something acute, where you have acute limb ischemia, 
or is it something chronic where you have chronic lupus ischemia? If it's acute, then your thought process goes to maybe some type of embolic event. If it's chronic, then you kind of have time to get all these labs and the revascularization procedure. So in your HPI, timing is really important. You want to know how long it's been there. The next thing is, like we said, we're going to take this person in for a partial first rate end. But before we do, this person has non palpable pulses. We order these tests. The ABI is like a 0.7. The TSP, let's just say for this patient, is a 20 with a TBI of maybe 0.35. So this person is compromised and you decide that you want to get a vascular consult. The vascular comes down, sees the patient and says, okay, we'll, we'll do a procedure, we'll do an angiogram, maybe an angioplasty, arthrectomy, etc., whatever they decide to do. One of the most common questions that's going to come up is before you do your amputation and after a vascular does their procedure, what is the ideal time for you to do your amputation? So there's a big debate, so I put a star next to this, is what is the ideal time for us to do our amputation or the breedments after vascular does a revascularization procedure? If you ask one group of podiatrists, they might say about 48 to 72 hours is the most ideal time. Another group will say within one or two weeks. But if you speak to vascular surgeons, they'll say there's really no cutoff or time limit. You can really do the procedure whenever. They will tell you it's probably better to do it sooner than later. A question they may ask you during the interview is differentiating gangrene from necrosis. Necrosis is just a general term for non-viable tissue and tissue death. And that could be due to a number of reasons. Trauma is a reason you could get non-viable tissue also frostbite, and gangrene is a type of necrosis. And within gangrene, there's three main types that you need to know. Number one is dry or ischemic gangrene. Number two is wet gangrene. And number three is gas. Let's spend a little bit of time and talk about ischemic or dry gangrene. Let's just say during a case study, they just showed you a picture or told you you have a patient that has an ischemic calyx, and that's it just a dark necrotic ischemic calyx. No signs of infection, no ulcerations. How do you want to go about treating this patient? Well, in this case, if there's no signs of infection and you know the person has a history of peripheral arterial disease and extremely poor vasculature and a number of comorbidities and is not a candidate to be taken to the OR and there's no systemic risk of that necrotic toe, most times, you could actually just leave the toe alone and just put a beta dine dressing and just monitor these patients. So many times these patients will be in a nursing home and you'll bring them into your clinic every two or three weeks just to, for routine monitoring to make sure that there's no signs of infection. Because for the most part, it's extremely rare for a dry gangrene to become a wet gangrene. Usually they just stay dry and that will be it. Taking these pe people to the OR to do an amputation is actually more risk to the patient because now you're creating a wound that may not heal and now you're opening up a source of infection or a possible source of infection. So if they ever ask you how would you go about treating a digit that has chronic limb ischemia, it's not a bad answer to say just leave it alone because I don't want to create a wound that could become infected. I would just monitor this patient get a vascular console, put beardine dressings on, and just see what happens. If it becomes infected, then I'll take this person to the OR. If it doesn't become infected, I'll just keep monitoring. So that's the basis of peripheral arterial disease and ischemic gangrene. I hope you guys find this helpful in preparing for your residency interviews. Thank you for watching.